there are some other top stories that are trending in the country today. Let's take a look at that right now. Here are today's top crime stories trending on lawandcrime.com and across the country. A man in Tennessee was arrested by authorities after he allegedly ditched his date, stealing her car so he could take her god sister to the movies. The young Casanova, 21-year-old Kelting Griffin, was arrested at a drive-in movie theater in Memphis with his second date for reportedly stealing his first date's car when she stopped at a gas station to get cigars. Griffin allegedly took off with the woman's car to his second date with the woman's god sister, but the love connection was hampered when officers arrived and charged Griffin with theft of property. A woman in Virginia Beach was arrested for allegedly driving an ice cream truck while intoxicated on National Ice Cream Day and injuring three people. 35-year-old Elaine Durham was charged with a misdemeanor DWI and three counts of felony hit and run after she struck an occupied vehicle before she made like a banana and split from the crime scene. The three people in the vehicle sustained non-life-threatening injuries but are expected to be okay. Durham remains held without bond until the next court date. A woman in Hearst, Texas, accused of tossing her newborn baby in a dumpster, claims she didn't know she was pregnant. 28-year-old Alyssa Hazel Baker faces a capital attempted murder charge after she allegedly went to the bathroom at her job and the baby fell out before she placed the infant in a trash bag and discarded the baby boy in a dumpster. Authorities arrested Baker after a co-worker called police and told them she thought Baker had a miscarriage. Police were able to recover the infant from the dumpster and Child Protective Services is investigating the case. Those were today's top crime stories. I'm Anthony Velez for Law and Crime. Thank you, Anthony. Great reporting as always. Go to lawandcrime.com to learn about the other top trending stories of the day. But we have to talk about that baby case right now because I've heard things before and then I've heard things before. This is definitely one of them. So to help me talk about this case and also talk about the James Colley case, I have a very special guest joining me on set right now, legal analyst Norman Williams. Norman, it's good to see you. Good to see you too, Jesse. Okay. We've got to take a step back here. This woman claims that yeah. she didn't know she was pregnant. That's the defense she's going with right now? Yeah, that's a tough one, especially when she has a, a child, I believe. This isn't her first child. It's her second child. Can you, I mean, let's take, okay, really? Wow. That is f frightening in so many different levels that she's already a mother. But how do we know, have you ever heard of a situation where somebody says, hey, look, I didn't know I was pregnant? Is that ever something that ever works? And here, the facts don't go to support that. It does, it does happen. It's not the first time that I've heard of this, and not even in a criminal context, you know, just in a regular context, it does happen. But it just seems unbelievable. I mean, again, she's been pregnant before in her life. She knew that she was pregnant. What about her Google searches? Wasn't she searching about pregnancy? Pregnancy, um, DNA, herbs that pregnant women shouldn't eat, how to abort a fetus, how to terminate a pregnancy early. So did she think that someone would buy this? I mean, and again, what was her plan? Because I know that she was working when the baby fell out. What was her plan to get rid of this baby exactly? I think I'm a bit confused. Right. She, she had the baby, and she put the baby in the toilet, ran to get a garbage bag, asked one of her coworkers at the super salad that she was working at for a pair of scissors, cut, cut the cord. Oh, my gosh. Put the baby in the bag tied it, closed it, went outside, threw the bag in a dumpster. I want, just take a second, everybody. Take a second to listen to what Norman just described, because those are the facts. The baby's alive, though, right? The baby's alive, and, and, and the baby is still alive. How did they, how were they able to rescue the baby so quickly? One of her co-workers very smartly called 911. Paramedics came. Police came. And they just asked her, what's going on? And she gave up, she gave it up. And they went into the dumpster, and the poor boy was in the bag in the bottom oh. of the dumpster. So because they got there soon enough, I mean, the baby, they think, was in the dumpster for about 45 minutes before they arrived. They took the baby to the hospital and uh, notified who she said was the father. And... He's, he's here to share life on this planet with the rest of us. Has the father said anything about this? Yeah, well, 
He, he did say that I am the father. I think they did a DNA test really quickly to confirm that. And they actually named the boy after him. Oh, my gosh. Now, she is charged with capital attempted murder. Yeah. It's the most serious charge here. Um, if you had to defend her, what's the best defense? I'm assuming uh, insanity. But, again, I mean, this right. is in Texas. I'm, you know, would insanity be the way to go over here? It's, the, it's kind of the only way to go. It's the only way to go, I think. Because I think the average juror would say to themselves, or the average person would go, oh, she must be crazy. And, and that's kind of where, you, that's your starting point. And you have to ask yourself, was she under a lot of stress? I mean, because she gives a, a full account to, to, to the police officers as to what she was thinking about, whether or not she knew what she did was right or wrong. But still, it's no small feat to do what she did. No. Not by any stretch of the imagination. No. Is there, uh, you know, honestly, I can't believe I'm going to say this, but I have to say it. Is it defense to say that she didn't know the baby was alive? No, nah, that's, a, that's a tough one. Um, that, that, yeah, that's, that's not going to work either. Yeah. I don't think I don't gonna think work. a lot's going to work for her in many different ways. So, uh, you know, look, we'll update everybody about this story as soon as we know more. But that is the face of a woman who took her newborn baby, wrapped him up, and threw him in a dumpster. And luckily, as Norman said, the baby's okay, and he's here to share his life with the rest of us. So, Norman, thank you for your insight into that really, really disturbing case. Again, you can go to lawandcrime.com to follow other top stories. Now, before we talk about the James Colley case, I have to do a little self-promotion. <laughs> Me and Andrew Icebrook, who's a big member here at Abrams Media, we have a podcast called Guys Who Law. We encourage everybody to check it out. It's about two millennial lawyers talking about the top legal issues of the day. Our new episode just dropped. We think you're going to like it. We talk about Brett Kavanaugh, the new Supreme Court pick, as well as some crazy new laws. And we talk about a whole different bunch of issues. And guess what? Virginia, Virginia Warner, our very own producer in the back over there, she was on our uh, episode two, two weeks ago. So you got to check it out. We talk about all different things, and we do a lot of different special content here on Law and Crime. So that's Guys Who Law. Check it out. My self-promotion's done. Let's get back to our live trial. As you know, we were covering the James Colley case gavel to gavel live every day. And again, we will tell you the verdict later on in the day. But I want to start from where the prosecution uh, delivered their closing argument because this is a, a terrific summary of their case and why they believe this man should be found guilty of first-degree murder. Take a look. That was the prosecution's closing argument. I'm here with Norman Williams. Let's talk about something real quick. When you get a new client, so if you were representing James Kyle, you get him, you hear this, what is the first thing that you look at when he's telling you the story of what happened here? Because they ultimately conceded the fact that he was the, uh, the shooter. Um, I think you want to try to dip into the rampage, his emotion. You know, what is it that, what is it that fueled, fueled this melee? You know, because it's, his reaction is not normal, let's say, but... Well, that's a, that's but, a statement. But nothing, <laughs> nothing hurts more than a broken heart. And, right. uh, you know, you, you, just, you just would hope that people can control themselves more. I, 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 would, I would hope so. And so, so you try to get into the psyche, see what he's thinking, try to paint a picture for the jury, which is what the defense really ultimately did. They tried to paint a different picture in their minds. And we'll let you know if that worked after this. There you go. Prosecutor really delving into the details of this case. And what you hear is, and what you see, is you see James Colley there. You see the back of his head constantly throughout this case, just basically head down, not looking. It's, it's a very interesting thing to see. Um, I'm back here with Norman Williams, our legal analyst here on set. I want to talk about premeditation, because that's really what the prosecution is going for. They're saying this was a cold-blooded killer. He deliberated on this, and he made a choice. But how does that form uh, premeditation? People assume it's days before. Can it be in the right moment? Because if we know he got that bad court ruling and then went to do this, how does premeditation work then? I mean, I think in ways premeditation is kind of hard to prove in this, in this situation, although it does look like he was kind of like a runaway freight train. It seems like he did one thing after another, and his anger levels were shown in what he, what he was doing, like when he burned her clothes in the backyard. 
I mean, there's, there's, there's tons of anger there. You know, of course, when we look at the end result, in hindsight, it does seem like something more should have been done. But yeah. if he planned this out, I would have. I would think he wouldn't yeah. have done it at 11.30 in the morning. I, 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 I agree. Well, we'll, we'll have, have to talk more about it in a minute, Norman. We'll be right back. Well, that's some of the defense's closing argument. We'll play a little bit more. Let's bring back in Norman Williams. So, Norman, first question to you, why would they drop the prescription medication defense midway through the case? They said they're not going to pursue that now or in an appeal, but if their uh, client should be found guilty, they may bring that up in the penalty phase. I think that they probably didn't have expert testimony that would support the defense. That's my guess. They said that they were planning on doing it, though. They were going to plan on bringing in some experts. Yeah, we, we plan on doing a lot of things in life, but when they don't pan out, then you have to change course. You have to switch directions. I mean, and that's probably what happened. But if they think that they could bring the experts on for the penalty phase, the death penalty phase, why not bring it on during the trial phase? There might be some mitigation, but not a defense. Interesting. So the fact that Ambien may have had an effect on him might, might mitigate the severity of his decision, but it doesn't excuse his decision. So in other words, it's different standards, different parts of the case, I get that. Uh, so now they seem to be victim blaming, victim oh, bashing. Boy. Is that what you're getting? Is that what you're seeing? Yeah, and it, that, that just doesn't work. You cannot stand in front of human beings and tell them that it's her fault that she's dead. It's because she did this and she did that. Blaming the victim only works when you have self-defense, a self-defense argument. Right. Otherwise, you can't, you can't say that anything this poor woman did explains why she's no longer with us. It just doesn't work. It's offensive to people. Well, one of the reasons they might be doing it is because, as I said, they want to try and get out of that felony murder way of first-degree murder. So one of the ways that he could be found guilty of first-degree murder is if you say, hey, look, during the commission of a really dangerous felony, such as aggravated stalking or burglary, Amanda died, uh, Lindy died. And right. we're talking about, again, aggravated stalking and burglary. So if he can say, I mean, this is the argument that they're about to say, that, hey, you know what? This wasn't aggravated stalking because Amanda Colley had as much contact with James Colley. She, wanted, she was in his life. This can't be stalking. Let's hear the defense's closing argument where they talk a little bit more about Amanda Colley. Take a look. Okay, so what the defense is doing is something kind of strategic here. They're saying, let's get our client out of the felony murder part of the first-degree murder statute, saying, uh, because under the rule, that you could find their client guilty of first-degree murder if, during the commission of a dangerous felony like aggravated stalking, Amanda died. Well, that's not fair, because... What they're saying is Amanda had as much contact with James during this period, even though there was a restraining order. She was violating it just as much as everybody else. And you know what? They still had a relationship. This wasn't stalking. Norman, do you believe that? Is that a valid argument? No, that argument doesn't work. Look, when an order of protection is issued, it's issued for one party to stay away from the other. Not, it's not a two-way street. So her reaching out and contacting him doesn't violate the order. But isn't there something to be said that she didn't feel that level of stalking or threat that uh, the prosecution may be characterizing it as, and that's something the jury should consider? Now, that's true. That's a decent argument. But here's the problem with when you're trying to defend a felony murder. Here we have a man that was given an order of protection that morning, right? Yep. And he went into the house. Yep. Which means that he purposely violated the order of protection which is a crime, right? Mm -hmm. They charge him with burglary. Burglary is just entering a dwelling with the intent to commit a crime therein. Yep. So if he enters the house with the intent to violate the order of protection, there you go. then they have the burglary. See? They don't need the aggravated stalking. Like the felony murder rule is this technical, it's this well, hard. It's, it's a hard. hard rule. We've it's seen hard. But we saw Tex MacGyver got convicted of that, and we can't ignore it. Always happens. We'll talk more about this when we come back. There's a lot to talk about in the James Colley case. So stay tuned. We're talking about what the defense's strategy here is, because it changed. First, they were saying that they were going to argue the Ambien defense or prescription medication defense, that this is why their client should be excused, that it wasn't his fault, that it was prescription medication, that deadly, uh, yeah, for lack of a better word, deadly cocktail that created all these 
emotions and created this whole situation. But now they're switching gears and they're doing a little bit of a different strategy. Want to bring back in legal analyst Norman Williams. So we talked about how they're trying to say, hey, this wasn't a burglary, uh, this wasn't a uh, aggravated stalking. But now what they're trying to say with the burglary um, is that, you know, he had a right to go to her house because he had his clothes there. Does that make sense? He didn't have a right to go. He was told to stay away. The Even order, if his clothes are there. The order didn't say, stay away except for you can go to get your clothes and your sneakers and shoes and things. That's not what the order says. Okay. And I'm sure that the judge also told him, if you need to get your things, call a local sheriff and you can go there escorted and you'll be escorted out as soon as you get your things. I mean, that's how that works. <laughs> so, so we're trying to understand what the defense is doing here, and they've been tacking it at multiple different levels. They're also saying it's not a premeditated first-degree murder, the classic example. And we, we talked about it a little bit. We unpacked it. I want to unpack it a little bit more. Premeditation, do you get the sense that this guy was thinking about killing her for days, thinking about killing her for hours, or thinking about killing her in the minutes before? What, what did you see? I think he was probably thinking about killing her for a good while but he wasn't planning a murder so you can think about something I want her dead versus this is how I'm going to do it so is that not first-degree murder I, mean, I, don't, I don't think so I don't think that's really premeditation I, okay and I, and I think I, I tell you I think the best defense in a case like this is is extreme emotional disturbance okay so what is that real quick that's a uh, in the, it's kind of in the heat of the moment. Something happens and you just kind of lose your mind. You know, you understand the difference, differences between right and wrong, but you're so charged up at that moment that you just can't control yourself. You lose control of, of your emotions. Well, the argument was that when he saw this shirtless picture of Lamar Dobberly, who is Amanda Colley's romantic interest, that set him off. Let's play a little bit more of the defense's closing argument and we're going to talk a little bit more about the possibility of a defense working here. We'll talk about it in a minute. Here's some more of the defense's closing argument. Okay, everybody, so that was the defense's closing argument. Now, remember, he's not just charged with first-degree murder and the deaths of um, L Amanda Colley and, Lamar and, excuse me, Amanda Colley and Lindy Dobbins, but he's also charged with attempted first-degree murder. And that's for Rachel Hendricks and Lamar Dobberly, the two surviving victims. Let's bring back in Norman Williams to talk about that. So, Norman, my question to you is, the argument that, you know, he just opened fire, couldn't really see Lamar, this wasn't attempted first-degree mur murder. You can't shoot what you can't see. If anything, this is attempted manslaughter. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, the problem is, is when you do something really reckless, right, you can't see inside of the house. But if you're shooting through the door... If you're shooting through a window, you're shooting through the walls, you're intending to hit something. You're not, a, you're not intending to hurt the door. You're not intending to hurt the window. Yeah. You're hoping that the bullet lands on another human being. So yeah, I, I think there's a decent enough argument to be made that it's not, it's not murder, it wasn't intentional, it's manslaughter, he did something reckless. Okay. So that argument does work. You know, the second-degree murder rule or the second-degree murder uh, statutes that I've usually seen, in the cases you've usually seen, a prime example is if somebody goes into a nightclub, fires a weapon right. uh, in their crowd of people, and somebody gets killed. They're not really intending to kill that person, but they're creating, they're showing a, gr a depraved indifference to human life by firing into an open right. crowd. If he went on a shooting spree, opened up fire into this house, Whoever he could hit, he could hit. Remember, right. Lindy Dobbins, he didn't really have a connection to her. It was really Amanda Colley and Lamar Dobberly seemed to be after. Right. So couldn't this be seen more like a second-degree murder case? Yeah. I mean, usually, usually most murders are second-degree murders. Two people get into a dispute on the street, one right. kills the other. Usually second-degree is what it is because there was no planning. There was no... There was no... There was no story, backstory before the incident. So that is what it is. As for, as for the friend that, unfortunately, gets killed and the others that get shot, right, they probably weren't the object of his rage. But they just had the unfortunate luck to be in the house when he came in to go crazy. You, you know, Norman, we're talking legal back and forth right here. Hopefully our viewers are enjoying it. But the question is, if you're sitting on a jury, how much do they pay attention to the specifics of the law and the jury instructions? And oh, this is the difference between first, second, manslaughter. It can get confusing. I get confused all the time. I find that juries really pay attention on homicide cases. They do. They might 
not care on a drug case. They might not care on a shoplifting case. The specifics of the language. The specifics, but with murder, they pay attention. They Why? pay attention. Because there's so much at stake? Because there's so much at stake and there's a life lost, and the person that they're judging, in a sense, is going to lose their life if convicted. Mm. You know, right. either, either by way of a capital punishment or life in prison. You said it right. There's always a lot at stake there and a lot of lives at stake. So you know what we're going to do is we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to play you some of the prosecution's rebuttal closing argument. Their last opportunity to put in the minds of the jury that James Colley should be found guilty. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Welcome back, everybody. So we're talking about the James Colley case out of Florida. We're recapping this entire case for you about this horrible shooting that took place where a man is charged with the murder of his estranged wife and her best friend by, like, well, as I said, going on a shooting rampage in a house. There were two surviving victims. We're probably going to play you their testimony later on in the day. Miraculously, they survived, and it'll be very interesting for you to hear the words of people that were right there. But before we talk about the James Colley case, there are a lot of other stories in the news trending. So we want to talk to you about it right now. Take a look. Here are today's top crime stories trending on lawandcrime.com and across the country. A man in Tennessee was arrested by authorities after he allegedly ditched his date, stealing her car so he could take her god sister to the movies. The young Casanova, 21-year-old Kelton Griffin, was arrested at a drive-in movie theater in Memphis with his second date for reportedly stealing his first date's car when she stopped at a gas station to get cigars. Griffin allegedly took off with the woman's car to his second date with the woman's god sister, but the love connection was hampered when officers arrived and charged Griffin with theft of property. A woman in Virginia Beach was arrested for allegedly driving an ice cream truck while intoxicated on National Ice Cream Day and injuring three people. 35-year-old Elaine Durham was charged with a misdemeanor DWI and three counts of felony hit and run after she struck an occupied vehicle before she made like a banana and split from the crime scene. The three people in the vehicle sustained non-life-threatening injuries but are expected to be okay. Durham remains held without bond until the next court date. A woman in Hearst, Texas, accused of tossing her newborn baby in a dumpster, claims she didn't know she was pregnant. 28-year-old Alyssa Hazel Baker faces a capital attempted murder charge after she allegedly went to the bathroom at her job and the baby fell out before she placed the infant in a trash bag and discarded the baby boy in a dumpster. Authorities arrested Baker after a co-worker called police and told them she thought Baker had a miscarriage. Police were able to recover the infant from the dumpster and Child Protective Services is investigating the case. Those were today's top crime stories. I'm Anthony Velez for Law & Crime. Anthony, thank you so much for those stories, and I know it's not easy reporting on them, particularly the baby one. So I want to talk about that one right now. Uh, again, you can go to lawandcrime.com to follow all the top trending stories, including this, but I want to talk about that baby one right now. Bring back on legal analyst uh, Norman Williams. Mm -hmm. My gosh. Um, so she is being charged with attempted capital murder here. Uh, what is a defense for her? I mean, you see, she's denying that she was pregnant. What is she going to say, that she didn't think the baby was alive? What, what's the possible defense for her? I think, um, one, is she didn't realize the baby was alive and to say that the baby was stillborn, but that doesn't work because the baby is alive. And the only thing that we're left with, really, is, again, extreme emotional disturbance, I think, you know, or, or insanity. But, you know, the problem... How does that play? How does that work exactly in the mind? What do you say that she... So, what does she suffer from that would cause this? Explain. Well, that she, whatever she suffered from, she wasn't capable of understanding the, the severity of her actions. She, she didn't know the difference between right and wrong, you know, that, or that she was suffering some sort of delusion. That she just wasn't based in reality, you know. And, and it's tough. The reason why that's tough in this case in particular is I was going over the, the arrest warrant from uh, Tarrant County in, in, in um, Texas, and the officer... That, that executed this, that filled out this warrant, just put in the, the most incredible level of detail in terms of his interview with, with this young woman. And he, he initially put, put the, any insanity defense to rest 
in his interview and in his, in his affidavit. It's amazing. Like, it's almost like he was an attorney, and he knew exactly what he was doing. Well, th that's, what's, that's what's so strange about this. Uh, that's what's so strange about this, that, um, you know, look, we, we have to talk about this baby case in a little bit more, but uh, we have to hit a quick break. We'll be back in a minute, and there's a lot more to talk about here on Law and Crime. Yeah, coming back, everybody. Coming back, everybody. We did too, did, did too early of a break. We still have to talk about this baby case, so let's talk about that for a second. Um, you were talking about it, about what she might say here, but I'm still confused because you listen to the details of it. She knew what she was doing. She looked up pregnancy on the Internet. So she got a paper bag. She got a bag to put the baby in and dump in the, t in the dumpster. How do you say that she's insane? I mean, it's not like she thought that she was giving the baby off to aliens or something like that, which is probably the, how bizarre and left field she would need right. to go, right? Right, yeah, basically. Yeah, I mean, this is horrible. I mean, in today's world, right, everything we do is recorded somewhere, right? If you're, if you're not on video somewhere, you're on your phone all day. We're all on our phones constantly. And where we go on the Internet is recorded. So she had been planning this. She had been wanting to terminate this pregnancy for some, some time. Why she didn't have an abortion or, you know, do something else. I don't know why she didn't give the baby up for adoption. I don't know. You know, it could just merely be the fact. This case actually, this case actually might be something that the forces that are trying to protect against Roe v. Wade being overturned mm -hmm. use. You know, states like Texas, a woman's access to abortion services is very limited and this just might be an example of a young girl that didn't know what to do you know what this is an example of whichever way you slice it not everyone should be parents that's, that's what it really should be not everyone should be a parent and you mentioned earlier she is already a parent which is shocking to say the least what are some of the details that we do not know, Norman? I know that you've researched this case a little bit further. Is there some things that you think that the viewers should know that maybe we just don't know about yet? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, thing, the, day starts, the day starts with, uh, with Alyssa Baker going to work instead of going to a hospital. Right. And I'm sure when she was on her way to work, she knew that she was about to give birth. Right. It's not the first time. She knows her body. Yeah. She right. hid it from people, though? They didn't know? Well, she tried to hide it from people. People suspect it. Yeah. You know, I mean, your body changes so much that it's hard to hide those things. Right. You know, your, your eating habits, your, your, your toileting habits. Sure. Right? Everything, everything changes. So she's, in the, she's in, the, in the bathroom. She has the child. And one of her coworkers kind of walks in and sees blood everywhere. Oh. And calls an ambulance and says that I believe that my coworker just had a miscarriage. That's what she thought. She thought it was a miscarriage. Th her that, coworker did. That coworker is a hero. That coworker called authorities in time to save the baby. And save Norman, the baby's baby. okay, right? The baby's okay. But my gosh, that's a, that's the miracle in all this that the baby survived. The baby's okay. I mean, in that sense, from a physical point point of view. But I don't know how you explain this to the baby moving forward. Right, and that's the other thing too. When I I was thinking about this last night, and I said, you know, today's world is a little bit different. You know, when we want to find out about someone, we get online and we just Google a name, and bam, there's this all this information. Yeah. What happens when you Google your mother's name and you find out that she threw you away? I what, don't have an answer. What does that do an to you? I don't know. How do you get through life knowing that? Knowing that, I mean, it's it's hard enough for people that find out that they're adopted years later when they're an adult, and they have to deal with the is those issues of, well, my adoptive parents weren't honest with me, and then my real parents didn't want me. But this, and that's a tough one. That's a tough one, and this is even worse. Mama threw me away. She literally, threw, literally, Norman. She threw me in the garbage with the with the with the spoiled lettuce and and, and, and the bad fries. L literally, it's crazy. It's the worst. Norman, thank you so much. So go to longcrime.com to follow the other top trending stories of the day. I want to flip back to James Colley, the case out of Florida. I'm going to play you right now the prosecution's rebuttal closing argument, their last attempt to tell the jury this man should be found guilty. Let's play that for you right now. Okay. The prosecution delivering their rebuttal closing argument. I'm here with Norman Williams, their last opportunity to really get in the minds of this jury and saying, hey, you know what? 
this guy is guilty, and do not blame for one second Amanda Colley for this. You think it's effective? Very effective. Very effective. Like I said, you can't blame a victim. You can't blame a dead person for, for their death unless they did something to cause it, like attack you, come at you, lunge at you. And, and, and the fact that there's so many text messages and voicemails from the defendant bashing the victim. Real quick, we have 20, uh, 10 seconds. That has to affect a jury, right? It definitely does. It definitely does. It lets them, it lets them know how, how hot and emotionally charged this, this incident was and how, how much he just flew off the handle. And I think people are always looking for the bad guys. They're looking for the good guys. Who to side mm -hmm. for in a case in here where you have two victims and the guy admitted to doing it? It's a tough case for the defense. But we'll let you know how they did in a little bit. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Hi. Prosecution's rebuttal closing argument being delivered right there. That was the last thing the jury heard before they went to their deliberations. I uh, want to bring back in Norman Williams. Norman, you were telling me this is not standard. Uh, here in New York, it's a little bit different. So you don't see these prosecution rebuttal closing arguments, right? No. Here in New York, they open first. And Prosecution opens first. Opens first and they close last. So what's interesting, I was thinking in my mind, like, what would be different about how I would deliver a closing if the prosecution went first? Well, I'm sorry, in New York, the defense opens first or the pro in their closing argument? In the closing argument, defense goes first, yeah. and then the prosecution goes after. Okay, interesting. So, so when we try to figure out what to say in our closing, one thing that, that's usually a, that's very effective is to be able to anticipate what arguments the prosecutor is going to put forth. So if you argue pretty strongly, like, look, when I sit down and I stop talking, this prosecutor is going to get up, and he or she is going to say one, two, and three. So when the prosecutor gets up and makes those arguments, the jury is like, oh, yeah, we already heard this. Yeah, we were waiting for this. Now, on the other hand, if the prosecution goes first, that changes things. Because one of the beauties of opening statements as a defense attorney is you get to talk and speak after the prosecution has already said everything that they can about what they think the evidence is going to show. Right. So it's, it's, it's easy to attack it. Now, if the prosecution closes first, you have that same feeling that you can attack what the prosecution says. The problem, though, is you're not the last person speaking. Right. And they get to get they get to come back and say, Yeah, yeah, yeah never mind what he said. Let's just let's just unpack the, the nonsense of, of, of the of counsel's arguments. It's interesting. Always an interesting strategy, and as you said, it depends upon what state you're in. Now we've been playing you the open we've been playing you the closings, but I want to play you probably in my opinion the most important testimony of this entire case. This is Rachel Hendricks, the surviving victim. She was there that day during the shooting, and she even talks about being grazed by a bullet. Let's go to her testimony right now. Welcome back, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We're covering the James Colley case out of Florida, and there's so much to dissect in this case about a man who's charged with brutally killing his estranged wife. They were just... He, earlier in the morning of this shooting that took place in this shooting rampage, he was ordered by a judge to stay away from her. Well, he didn't really do that. He didn't stay away from her at all. He ended up killing her and her best friend, Lindy Dobbins. So we're trying to understand this whole shooting. We're recapping the entire case. We're playing the prosecution. We're playing the defense. We're playing the key witnesses. And then later on today, we'll let you know what the verdict ultimately is. Don't peek. Don't peek, everybody. Just follow us. We'll, we're guiding you the right way. Now, before our last break, we were playing you the testimony of Rachel Hendricks. Probably, in my own opinion, the most important testimony, a key eyewitness, she was right there, right there. She was in the closet when uh, James Colley, according to her, busted it down, went in there, killed Lindy Dobbins right before he, right after he had just killed Amanda. And she, Rachel, ran out of that house. She's lucky to be alive. Want to bring back on Norman Williams, our legal analyst, and we're going to jump back to Rachel Hendricks in a second. To have a surviving victim testify, to have that. You don't always get that. No, no. Usually lucky that you don't have that. Right. Right? Dead people tell no tales. But right. when there's a survivor, you have a witness that can give the full account and give the emotion and, and, and get across to the jury how horrible of a situation it was. How difficult is it for her to testify, and how difficult also is it for the defense to try to cross-examine this kind of witness? Well, defense, you don't want to beat up on the witness and make things her fault, which you can't. And you can't talk her out of what she lived through. Right. Can't do that. It's tough. 
if anything, you can only use her to show that that the defendant was in a heightened emotional state if you're trying to put forth some insanity defense. But uh, other than that, I mean, it's just, it's just damaging testimony. Really damaging testimony. And on top of the fact, she can't even look at him in open court. She well, had to take a breath. Well, see, that's the other thing that happens with life that, you know, the witnesses, they sit on that stand and they're talking about the incident. And you could almost see the incident playing through the reflection in their eyes. You can see how horrible and traumatic the incident was. And you can also see how people move past things in life and then they have to talk about it again. Right. And then they get driven back to the same place that they were the day that they were going through the trauma. And that's just powerful. Absolutely. It's, it's powerful. extremely powerful. And you know what, we're talking about it, but I want to play you it now. This is some more of Rachel Hendrick's very emotional and compelling testimony. You know, you can't help but look at Rachel Hendricks and wonder what's going on in her mind. Back here with Norman Williams, legal analyst, we're talking a little bit as we were watching that about what is going through her mind, what is going through Lamar Dobberly's mind, the other surviving victim as they go on in their life. Yeah, I mean, I think Dobberly is probably going to have to wrestle with survivor's guilt. You know, I don't know what the layout of the house was, but it kind of seems like if, if uh, Cauley would have went in one direction versus another, he would have come across Dobberly first which is, that's really who he was going after, right? Yeah, Do Dobberly went right through the garage and was able to escape he and Rachel Hendricks. So it's, it's a, m a miracle that they survived, but it's a, not an easy thing for them to yeah. wrestle with, right? And um, listen, Norman, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. It was great having you Always on. Always a pleasure. And you know, there's uh, it's a, never an easy case, but you break it down in a perfect way. So thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, everybody, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a break. When we come back, there is so much more to talk about in this case. So stay tuned. We'll be back in a minute.